It's certainly a pleasure to be here and to uh, um, speak at this really exciting meeting. And uh, I'm a structural biologist and, and biophysicist by training. And um, over the last 15 years or so, um, I've dedicated myself to trying to develop, develop methods to bring biological machines to life. I think many of you are familiar with the revolution that's occurred over the last two decades in structural biology. You'll hear from Joaquin Frank, one of the pioneers of applying cryo-electron microscopy to biological systems. You'll hear some other structural talks here. Um, and in, in addition, there's been amazing breakthroughs in, in X-ray crystallography. And all of these methods, what they do is they provide you a static three-dimensional view of the structures and architectures of biological systems. And as the methods have improved, the size and scale and complexity of the systems that can be studied have uh, increased uh, massively over time. Um, so what I'm going to speak about, though, today is the ribosome and translation, which is kind of the original macromolecular machine whose structure was resolved now almost two decades ago um, by X-ray crystallography. The ribosome is responsible for the process of protein synthesis. Um, but what we've been very interested in is not just looking at these pictures. What we've been trying to do is bring these biological systems to life. And the analogy I like to use is of this beautiful Degas painting that you see over here. Um, Degas was a fantastic artist, and this painting captures the motion of the ballerina. It captures even some of the essence of some other ballerinas being here on the side that are about to come up the stage. So you really get a sense of the movement, but by viewing the painting, you don't really see the entire ballet itself. So really what we've been trying to do is develop methods to watch these molecular machines in, in action in real time. And I hope to relay to you, I think, some of the achievements of these types of approaches and also want to underscore some of the limitations of these types of approaches, which of course is an awesome opportunity for physicists such as yourself to model the system. So let's, let's just get oriented and, and give you a, a brief overview of translation in the ribosome. So the ribosome is a large multi-megadalton RNA protein machine. In all organisms, it's made up of two subunits, a small subunit, which we'll call 30S um, in bacteria, and a large subunit called 50S. Uh, in bacteria. These two halves come together to make uh, a, a 70S or 80S ribosomal particle. Um, it's a nanomachine, so its architecture is about 25 nanometers by 25 nanometers. Um, and because it's so large, the binding sites here for ligands are binding sites for macromolecular machines themselves. So there's a cleft where the messenger RNA runs through the small subunit. And there's individual binding sites for the transfer RNAs that are going to be involved in the process of decoding. There's the P site where the peptidyl tRNA, this is the tRNA that will have a growing polypeptide chain attached to it. There's an exit site where tRNAs that have gone through the process of translation and are deacylated, they don't have anything attached to their 3' end, will go to be discarded from the ribosome. And there's the A site where the process of decoding will take place, where tRNA will come in, the triplet pairing that's the essence of the genetic code will occur, and uh, a tRNA be, will be selected. The process of peptide bond formation occurs on the large subunit in a RNA-only cleft that's called the peptidyl transferase center. Um, an essence of this uh, machine is that the, the two subunits come together and form a very large interface that's primarily, but not only, RNA-mediated. And this intersubunit interface will reorganize throughout the process of translation, and its reorganization will be a central part of the things that I'll speak about today. Um, there are also these peripheral elements that are involved in regulating the comings and goings of ligands. We'll see that um, ligands will flux onto the ribosome in, on this side, and there's a center here that involves 
protein and RNA that's involved in stimulating GTP hydrolysis functions on some of the protein cofactors that are involved in translation. And then there's a dynamic stalk here called the L1 stalk, which is involved in releasing those deacylated tRNAs as the process occurs. And then there's a long, um, over 100 angstrom uh, tunnel that uh, protrudes through, or goes through the 50S subunit, and this is where the growing nick and polypeptide chain will snake its way out. This tunnel covers about 35 amino acids worth of protein before that protein becomes exposed out into solvent and can begin to fold into higher order architectures. The dimensions of the tunnel are such that only alpha helical, very small local secondary structures can form, but global tertiary not, structures cannot form. We'll talk a little bit more about how that might regulate translation. And just to give you a little bit of an overview, here's a movie that shows this intersubunit interface shown right here. And in this case, I have a P site tRNA bound here in green. And we'll see later on, this is a incoming transfer RNA that's reading a codon that's bound to one of these GTPase factors, elongation factor TU. And so just to put this into cartoon format, the directional dynamics of translation can be considered very simply here. Um, you have a messenger RNA, and we'll see that it's not just a linear strand of information. It itself has structure and context to it. But that messenger RNA has a series of these three base codons, but it has a starting point codon, a start codon, that Umesh here has spent a lot of time investigating, and a stop signal or stop codon uh, located at the three prime end. And what happens during translation is first a directed assembly process. In this assembly process, the small subunit and the, a special tRNA, initiator tRNA, must recognize this start codon amongst all the other triplets and then signal through a series of events for the other half of the ribosome to join. Now, this event I'm not going to discuss more here, okay, but we've studied this extensively, is essential because it sets the reading frame for translation. A mistake of even one nucleotide here will take a sensical sen sentence and turn it into gibberish. So there's a lot of regulation that occurs at the level of initiation. This is often thought to be the rate limiting step when measurements have been made uh, in vivo. But once I've assembled this initiated tRNA and it's enzymatically competent to perform the subsequent steps of translation, the, the, the uh, ribosome begins to bind to and select appropriate tRNAs. We'll talk about this process in more detail. Those transfer RNAs have uh, appropriately attached amino acids at their three prime end so that you can get peptide bond formation. And the ribosome will now move down the messenger RNA through a process of translocation, and the polypeptide chain will elongate in this tunnel. Okay? And this gets repeated again and again and again until you get to the stop codon, and another series of factors come in to terminate the process and split the subunits. Okay, so it's a very directional and very dynamic process. And so this is the real logic of why we'd want to track this using some kind of real-time approaches. And decades of work have been performed biochemically, biophysically, structurally, to define the substeps that occur in this process. Right? And this cycle of translocation, of, of, of translation, where we extend the polypeptide by one amino acid, is called the translation elongation cycle. Right? And it starts off as follows. I have a ribosome here with a messenger RNA and a tRNA with a growing polypeptide chain attached to it, bound in the so-called P-site. And as we'll see in a moment, the two halves of the ribosome, remember I said there's this large ribosomal uh, intersubunit interface, that interface will reorganize throughout the translation elongation cycle. Um, and so what happens is you have this empty A site with a codon presented here. You need to select through the process of tRNA selection the right amino acyl tRNA into that A site. Once that tRNA is bound in the A site, the black polypeptide gets transferred over to the free amino group on this tRNA. And so now you have a peptidyl tRNA 
in the A site, you've elongated the chain by one, and subsequently, the two subunits rotate counterclockwise with respect to one another. We're going to call this the rotated state, and I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. You can see the tRNAs start to move in the direction they're going to want to move during the elongation cycle. This uh, diagonal configuration of tRNAs where the P site tRNA, excuse me, where the P site tRNA has moved its 3' end into the E site, and the A site tRNA has its 3' end positioned at the P site, is called a hybrid state. Right? This is a dynamic state where the tRNAs are preparing themselves for their subsequent movement during the next step, whereby elongation factor G, a GTPase, binds to this rotated hybrid state configuration, hydrolyzes GTP, and two things happen. I reset the conformation of the ribosome to this non-rotated state, and simultaneously, or semi-simultaneously, I move the tRNA codon anticodon pairs down with respect to the ribosome by three nucleotides precisely, so that I can repeat the process again and extend the next, uh, amino acid onto the chain. And so again, this has been extensively studied by many groups, and there are certain parameters here that are essential for efficient translation, which is obviously a central feature of life. One is speed. Um, that translation occurs rather rapidly between 1 to 20 amino acids per second, depending on whether you're dealing with bacteria or with eukaryotic organisms or in vitro translation systems, which are diluted with respect to uh, cellular milieu. Um, fidelity is very good. Even though we're using only three base pair interactions, which have certain thermodynamic constraints on their fidelity. When I put mis pairs in, the fidelity of translation is about one error every 3,000 amino acids incorporated. Since most proteins are shorter than 3,000 amino acids, that means most proteins are made without error. Right? And this is the classic error versus speed trade off that you, 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 you allow yourself to make some errors. Right, to allow yourself to move at a speed that allows you to do protein synthesis efficiently. And Mons Ehrenberg and his group in Uppsala has worked out that type of mathematics. Um, the energy use of this process is non-wasteful. You need to use TPs for every amino acid incorporated, one for the process of selection and one for the process of translocation. And we'll see that it's pretty good that it's not very wasteful in that uh, usage. And finally, because translation is so important and essential, and is really the last step of gene expression, where you go from transcription, splicing, transport, to subsequent uh, translation, it's the last opportunity to regulate gene expression. It's not obviously the last opportunity for regulation period. And so this process is very highly regulated and controlled with even higher levels of regulation as you move to more complex organisms. And so what we turn to, again, is a very simplistic physical approach to studying the problem. It's using single molecule, i.e. the ability to observe single molecules for long periods of time, and we're going to use as a conformational surrogate. Remember, my stated goal is to make molecular movies. I'd really love to see the three-dimensional positions of all the atoms in my ribosome as a function of time as they're going through the entire process. I'm not there yet. Walking Frank is closer. Okay? But I'm going to condense down that statement to a much smaller number of degrees of freedom. Right? And I'm going to use, starting off, just one degree freedom as my surrogate for confirmation. And I'm going to use Forster Resonance Energy Transfer, FRET. Very simple-minded approach. FRET is a dipolar interaction between two fluorophores. You need to have overlap of the emission band of an acceptor dye with uh, the uh, absorbance band of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry, of a, of a donor dye with uh, uh, um, the absorbance band of an acceptor dye. And so I have here a green and a red dye, the donor and acceptor dies, and the coupling between them depends on one over the distance of the sixth power. The efficiency of this process is very good at distances below about 20, 25 angstroms, 
and it's very poor at distances above about 80 angstroms. And it falls off as one of R to the sixth in the area between those two distances. And so imagine a thought experiment where I had a biomolecule with two conformations. One is the conformation is open, the other is closed. And I've put the fluorophores at some point in this biomolecule. How we do this, we can talk about more in detail. When I'm in this open form, the two dyes are far apart. I shine a green laser in, and most of the energy that I put into the system comes out as green fluorescence because the dipolar coupling between these two dye is very poor. If I then undergo a conformational change to this closed conformation, the two dyes are in close proximity, I illuminate the green dye, I get efficient non-radiative energy transfer to the red dye, but the light comes out as red even though I put in green energy. Okay? And this is the essence of FRET. Now, if I could plot a schematic of FRET, or, or fluorescence intensity as a function of time, and could simultaneously watch the behavior of these dyes on a single molecule, it would look something like this. When I'm in this low FRET conformation, I have high green intensity and simultaneously low red intensity. When the molecule undergoes a conformational change, I'll see a rapid anticorrelated change. The green will drop because that energy is going into being transferred to the red dye, my red emission comes up simultaneously. And then I'll spend some seri of seri a period of time in this high fret state where red is high and green is low, and then I'll have subsequently a conformational change backwards. Now the key point, and I don't need to say this to this audience, is people often misinterpret dynamics. When they say, oh, this process is occurring on a millisecond time scale, or this process is occurring on a seconds time scale, Implicitly, biologists believe that somehow that means the voyage over the mountaintop is taking a millisecond. But really what we're talking about is waiting times. We're waiting in this low fret state until there's a fluctuation to rapidly go over the transition state, whatever that is, over into your high fret state. Then you rattle around in the high fret state until you get a fluctuation backwards. So really what we're talking about is waiting times and traversal over barriers and barrier heights. And this will be important as we go through the talk. Now, why we want to do single molecule experiments, I think is, is probably obvious to many of you, is the beautiful dynamics that I showed you before gets washed out as, I, as soon as I start looking at an ensemble of molecules. Some might be in the closed state, some might be in the open state. Now, that's not to say, obviously, for centuries, physicists and physical chemists have come up with methods to measure dynamics in bulk with large numbers, Avogadro's numbers of molecules, by somehow synchronizing the system and watching the system evolve temporally. The problem is, is when you look at something like translation, where I'm going to go through repetitive processes in a directional manner, getting ribosomes to be synchronized through multiple rounds of translation, you can, I think you can see, it will be very difficult uh, and technically challenging. And that's just shown here, kind of like a race. If I started all my ribosomes at that initiation codon, right, and then said go by delivering factors or some, some way of starting the reaction, very soon the, uh, uh, the, the ensemble of, of translating ribosomes would get out of synchrony with one another, and my dynamic information starts to be lost. And so because of that, we've turned to single molecule approaches. Right? We want to watch ribosomes translating in real time, and really try to look at as many degrees of freedom as we can, again admitting this is a gross oversimplification system. What we're going to use is primarily fluorescence. We do do some optical trapping. But what we're going to do is put as dyes on as many things as possible. So we can look at up to six different fluorescent labels. Um, we're only going to be able to observe several constraints simultaneously as a function of time. Really, crudely speaking, we're going to be looking at global conformation of ribosomes and ligands and composition, the comings and goings of the cofactors of translation as a function of time. Okay. Our dynamic range is limited by the resolution of cameras that allow us to observe large fields of views of molecules uh, simultaneously. Right, these are normally even CCD cameras with millisecond-type timescale resolution. 
So I am making an assumption here that I'm only measuring dynamics on a millisecond time scale and slower. Right? I'm throwing out all the fast dynamics. Right? That is a very dangerous approximation. Luckily, translation is relatively slow. It really is a kind of millisecond to seconds type time scale process. If I was studying photosynthesis, you guys should throw me out of the auditorium. Okay. We're going to watch single ribosomes translate in real time. And something I won't talk about here today is because I can watch individual ribosomes, I can score outcomes. One ribosome may make one protein product. Another ribosome translating the same messenger RNA may make another protein product. And I can bin those and understand translational pathways. This has been very important for our work in studying translational recoding, where one messenger RNA of a given sequence can lead to different protein products. And we can talk more about that if you're interested. In okay. So how am I going to first monitor composition as a function of time? Well, here's a, here's a, a thought experiment where imagine I could put different color dyes on every different tRNA in a cell. There's some 40-some-odd tRNAs in E. coli. There's not 40 different spectrally distinct dyes, so this is a, really a thought experiment. But the idea would be is when my ribosome is trying to decode a codon that corresponds to my red tRNA, imagine a fluorescence experiment where the ribosome grabs this red tRNA, that tRNA was diffusing around in solution okay, through some excitation volume where my laser light was hitting, but now I bind to a ribosome, that ribosome's immobilized near a surface, that, that tRNA is no longer free to diffuse around, it then emits a burst of photons of that color for a period of time that it resides on the ribosome. Okay? Now we can do that experiment. The duration of the burst of fluorescence is the time it takes that tRNA to come onto the ribosome, undergo peptide bond formation, be translocated from the A to the P site, undergo another round of peptide bond formation, be translocated to the E site, and depart. So it's a residence time or a traversal time of that tRNA going through the ribosome. So we've done this kind of experiment. Here's an old experiment, but it, it, it gets the point across, which is I have a messenger RNA that I mobilize. I haven't said quite how I do the experiment, but I mobilize on a surface, and I'm going to watch the uh, translation of this individual messenger RNA in a, using a solution that has a green initiator tRNA, a red phenylalanine tRNA, a blue tRNA lysine, and a yellow uh, dye labeled tRNA valine. And I'm watching this all simultaneously. And the messenger RNA is a repeating message of phenylalanine lysine valine. And what you can see is you start with a green pulse, and you go red, blue, yellow, 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 until you get to the end of this messenger RNA where this valine um, is in the P site. This codon right here, which is a stop codon, is in the A site. I don't have the protein factors that read that stop codon. So stop codons are read by proteins, not tRNA. So the ribosome just stalls there. Right? And if you look at this closely, you can see sampling events, et cetera. Okay? The, the blue tRNA, is, in this case, we made it purposely slow. We can talk about how we did that. But what we can get from this experiment is the time it took me to translate each individual codon of the messenger RNA, which is really what we were trying to do with this type of approach. Now, the way we do this is a little trick. This is the only kind of experimental trick I want to give you, which is we um, take our system and immobilize it on a transparent surface that's been derivatized with polymers that make it inert to uh, nonspecific surface binding phenomenon. But then the sides of the, this makes it a nanocontainer. It's a nanocontainer with aluminum sidewalls. Light comes in the bottom and propagates upward along the z-axis, and emission pro propagates downward, and you collect the light. And you can see the dimensions of these holes are on the order of fractions of a wavelength of light. The light that goes in interacts with the sidewalls through surface plasmons. The end result is you quench fluorescence exponentially as you go up the z-axis, and you also quench emission coming back down. The result is you only observe fluorescence from fluorophores that are localized right near the surface. 
So what I can do is I can raise the concentration of free fluorescently labeled components. Those are floating around in solution. At very high concentrations, the normal way we do this experiment, the background of those free fluorophores would wash out any signal from that fluorophore binding to a molecule. Using this type of approach, and here's a little bit of a modeling of what goes on there, we can then do these experiments at high concentrations of fluorophores. This is important because translation is driven by high concentrations of tRNAs. Okay, so now let's go through the elongation cycle and show how we've probed it using these types of methods. The first experiments we did now over, over 15 years ago right, involved looking at the process of tRNA selection. And in this experiment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the tRNA in the P site have a label on it. These labels, now just for the biochemists here, Hey, there's a lot of homework you have to do in order to validate your systems. These fluorescent dyes aren't just little green stars that you put on a schematic. They're large, aromatic, charged molecules right, that can very much perturb the function of your system. So you have to do a lot of control experiments to demonstrate that putting a fluorescent dye did not cause your protein or nucleic acid to denature, misfold that there's not a steric block, that the fluorophore is not interfering with the kinetics of your system. So there's a lot of control experiments that have to be, due to do, uh, be done to do these experiments. But what we're going to do is we're going to put a donor dye here on the P-site tRNA, and then we're going to have a collection of tRNAs where the right tRNA will have a red acceptor dye on them. So this is going to be a FRED experiment. When this red dye, tRNA, it hasn't been selected yet, you can think of it as being at infinite distance. So there should be no fret. When that tRNA comes on the ribosome, okay, we should start to see fret. And then the change in fret is the trajectory of that tRNA as it gets selected and then undergoes the chemistry of uh, translation. And so just to remind you, tRNAs don't just bind to this A site alone, they're escorted. And they're escorted by this GTPase, which in bacteria is called elongation factor TU. Elongation factor TU has a high affinity for amino acyl tRNA. That's tRNA that has a amino acid that's been attached to its three prime end. There's a whole machinery of amino acyl tRNA synthetases that make sure that the right tRNA gets the right amino acid. That's not what I'm speaking about here. Now we're going to be talking about the fidelity of translation that occurs subsequent to that amino acylation process. But you can imagine here the dyes are rather far apart, but eventually what has to happen is this GTPase has to hydrolyze GTP and do two things let go of the ribosome and let go of the tRNA and get out of the way because it is what's preventing the three prime end of the tRNA to engage in chemistry with the peptidyl tRNA. And so when that happens, you could imagine I should go to high fret because the two tRNAs are snuggled closely next to one another. And that's exactly what happens. Here's some single molecule traces. I, you can maybe see them here. You start off with high green and low red, and you very rapidly get increases in FRET when the tRNA bind. Unfortunately, these um, FRET events are convoluted with the bimolecular binding kinetics of the ternary complex of the tRNA and factor to the ribosome. But because we're looking at single molecules, we can essentially work up the data any way we want to. And what we do is something called post-synchronization, where we just say, I don't care about the bimolecular binding. I care about all the events that happen subsequent to binding. So then I just take all of my single molecule traces and move them to the point where I first observe fret. And I'm going to call that time zero. And then everything subsequent to that are the intramolecular events that occur or the tRNA. And that's just shown, this remixing of the data is just shown here. And I think you get the point. This is now looking, superimposing hundreds 
of single molecule traces. So we don't ignore the ensemble, we just recreate the ensemble from the behavior of single individual molecules. Just like if I wanted to record a chorus, instead of recording all of you singing, I recorded each one of your voices and then went into the studio and mixed them together in order to create the choral piece. Right, that, you can imagine I have more freedom to uh, mix the, 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 the individual voices. But what you can see here is what this histogram shows is at short times, I come in at this lowish fret level, but I don't reside there very long, and I rapidly go up to this high fret level. That's the tRNA coming on as a ternary complex, pausing transiently at that far apart distance, and then the decision is made, this is the right tRNA, and selection occurs. Yes? Yes. I'm separating it in order to analyze the events that occur on the ribosome. Okay? I'm not saying the bimolecular binding is not important. It's absolutely essential to understanding the process. I'm trying to show you now what happens once that uh, initial binding event occurs. A lot of work has gone into studying the tRNA bimolecular kinetics. The first event that occurs is independent of the nature of the tRNA and involves protein-protein interactions of the factor with um, uh, the L7, L12. It's one of those dynamic stalks. Subsequently, then the codon engages with the, the anticodon, right? And then all of the events after that are the process really of selection. And so that's why I'm focusing on that. I'm not saying that the bimolecular kinetics are not important. They're obviously very important for understanding the process. But for us to analyze the data, we're just looking at the on ribosome events. Is that clear? Okay. So what happens now if I start to change what I'm looking at? First, let me not allow the factor to hydrolyze GTP. I put a non-hydrolyzable GTP analog, GDPNP. What happens is tRNAs, you can see I have a sampling event here, but then the tRNA comes on and just binds. But it binds to the state where the red and green are superimposed on one another. That's a medium-level fret state. So something has happened to stabilize the tRNA, which normally would only transiently uh, uh, occupy this state. Now it occupies it for a long period of time if I don't hydrolyze GTP. So that, that, these type of experiments allow us to assign what the fret levels are according to the biochemical states that we know the system has to traverse in order to perform translation. The second thing we do is... is we put non-hydrolyzable analogs in, but we change the codon to be near cognate. Now the tRNA only binds transiently to that uh, uh, program messenger RNA and then dissociates. So this is showing you the origins of fidelity. And that's just shown here, okay? Here's the normal behavior where I transiently pass through these lower fret levels to get up to high fret. If I don't allow GTP to hydrolyze, I get stuck at this medium level and never get to this high level. That's because the system's going to be stuck in this configuration. And then finally, when I don't have the right tRNA, this ternary complex will come in, will try to pair with the codon, right? But because the pairing is not a perfect base pairing match, it will get discarded rapidly from the ribosome. And I bring this up, this will be important at the end of my talk when I talk about some minor perturbations to this process. The final aspect of this is this is so delicately tuned, right? because this is such an essential process in biology, that minor perturbations, and when I say minor perturbations, remember, we're talking about a megadalton machine. Now I'm going to throw small molecules that weigh hundreds of daltons at this ribosome and disrupt the process. So these are antibiotics. There are many antibiotics that target translation. Um, the many antibacterials that are in use today um, uh, uh, block translation specifically of, uh, of bacterial ribosomes over human ribosomes. And here's a couple examples. Tetracycline is still a very important antibiotic. Um, that's an antibiotic that binds 
right where this tRNA has to fit its final codon-anti-codon -codon interaction. In short, it's like a door block. Right? It does not allow the tRNA to get into its final position. And if I add tetracycline and try to put the right tRNA in, I don't get stable binding events. I get these transient sampling events right, at a very low fret level. So the system is very much perturbed right, at early steps of tRNA selection. Likewise, if I use thiostreptone, which sits right here, where this ternary complex is eventually going to have to position itself, I get similar types of events. The, the, the ternary complex is destabilized, does not progress to the final state, and dissociates rapidly from the ribosome. Okay, well, let's assume that I've now selected the right tRNA. Right? That tRNA now has its three prime end positioned next to the peptidyl tRNA. And what happens is really primarily due to steric positioning right, by RNA elements. And what you get is attack of the free amino group on the aminoacyl tRNA attacking the carbonyl group of the peptidyl tRNA. That's what leads to the extension of the polypeptide chain by one. But what happens also is that releases the ribosome. That chemical reaction then leads to this intersubunit uh, rotation that was first pointed out by Joaquin Frank back in the early days of cryoelectron microscopy, when resolution was really at the nanometer uh, level. Um, but he proposed this intersubunit ratcheting, and it turns out to be correct as an essential feature of the elongation cycle. And so you get this counterclockwise rotation. We'll call that the rotated state of the ribosome. That's the substrate for the translocation factor. So by changing the conformation of the ribosome, you can direct the traffic of the ligands that have to sample the ribosome. So EFTU doesn't like this state. Those ternary complexes don't bind to this. EFG doesn't like the other state. So now EFG comes and binds ra more rapidly to this state. And what happens is still not clear, but you couple GTP hydrolysis to the re sorry, resetting of the ribosome. And that's just shown here. You go through this cycle of non-rotated high fret, peptide bond formation leads to the rotated state, EFG and GTP hydrolysis will reset it. So again, if I can do a fret experiment where I put dyes on the two subunits and I can somehow monitor the conformational change, one cycle of going from high fret to low fret to high fret is the elongation cycle. So now I have the ability, like an electrocardiogram, to watch the heartbeat of the ribosome. Each beat is one round of elongation. So we've used this type of approach very much. And obviously, having the structure of the ribosome allows us to have a blueprint to design these experiments very precisely. So we knew where to put the dyes. So here's an example. I start with a green messenger RNA that's down on the surface, and it had, I'm sorry, green ribosome, uh, small subunit. And then you can see initiation occurs. This is floating around in solution. When it decides to initiate, it binds, and I immediately get fret. The green drops, the red comes up, and then I start with the red high and the green low, and then I go to the red low and the green high, and then I come back to red high, green low. So that's one cycle of non-rotated, rotated, non-rotated non state. So that was one round of peptide bond formation and translocation. So not only do I get the dynamics at each codon, I get the subdynamics. I get the dynamics of decoding. That's how long, on average, that non-rotated state is. And I get behavior of translocation. That's how long I sit in this rotated state. And I have knobs I can turn. I can change the concentrations of the external ligands. Under many conditions, that's rate limiting. So by changing the concentration of EFG or ternary complex, I can lengthen or shorten the lifetimes of these states. Yes? Why does the rotation happen? It's a very good question. It's a, it's a subtle change in RN, mainly RNA-RNA interactions that occur across the subunit. Probably the driving force is 
when I form a peptide bond, I'll talk about this in a moment, I, I release free energy, right? But I also have a large rearrangement. The tRNA that originally had a peptide group on it now has a hydroxyl group. It swings and moves by a large distance. So there's coupled movements of ligands that probably lead also to this rearrangement in the subunit interface. It's not huge changes in interactions, but because it's such a large machine, these subtle changes uh, of RNA-RNA interactions lead to this, this twisting of the two subunits. It doesn't separate. It just, it, it, if, I can, if you can look down this axis, it does this. It doesn't do that. It's not peeling apart. It only peels apart when I get to the process of termination. Then I have to pull those two subunits apart. You don't want the subunits falling apart during elongation because that would lead to premature termination. I made a polypeptide that's only half the length, and then if the ribosome falls apart, that's a disastrous waste of energy. So one, one final little trick here, uh, experimental trick, which is I'm going to remove the red dye and I'm going to replace it with a molecular entity that can take in the energy through the FRET mechanism, but it's dark. It gives off its energy in the form of heat. So I can turn the FRET experiment into a one-color experiment. So this would be um, a, a high FRET and low FRET, because I'm just looking at the green signal in this green and so-called black hole quencher system. A lot of dangers in this type of experiment because the, having the two signals help you kind of sort through artifacts that occur photophysically. But the reason we do this is now I can move the red dye, which is very easy to detect, onto my ligands. And now I can start doing correlated, directly correlated ligand occupancy and ribosome conformation experiments. I can ask when a ligand binds, does a conformational change occur simultaneously, beforehand, after, or there's no correlation whatsoever? All right. And so we can do these types of experiments. The first I'm going to do is have that dye on the tRNA and ask how does conformation change as a function of tRNA occupancy. So in this experiment, I'm going to translate a messenger RNA that has a repeating phenylalanine and lysine uh, message the lysine tRNA will not have a label on it. It'll be performing in translation. We're not going to observe it directly. And what you can see here is, at this point, I translate a phenylalanine codon, and the phi tRNA comes on. And I think you can see simultaneously with this red signal coming up, the green goes from low to high. That's going from the non-rotated state to the rotated state. If I look at this very closely, the red proceeds by about 20 milliseconds. Because the red comes on, I need to do all of that tRNA selection business that I spoke to you about before. Then I form a peptide bond. And that's the signal for this conformational change. But the red tRNA stays on the ribosome. Because now I have to do, I have to translocate, okay, right here. I then have to decode the next codon. That's the lysine codon comes in, but that's dark, the lysine tRNA. I'm sorry, lysine tRNA comes in. Okay. Then I translocate again. Now the phi, phi tRNA departs. So what did I do? I came in to the A site. I'm the red tRNA. I got translocated into the P site. I'm still there, red tRNA. Next tRNA comes in. I do peptide uh, bond formation. Then I get translocated again to the E site, and I depart. A big question for us is, when does the tRNA depart from the E site? Because you need to get, to get that tRNA out of the way in order to continue. You can see in this experiment, the red departure is simultaneous with the resetting of ribosome conformation. So here there's a tight coordination of the choreography of translation between ligand occupancy and ribosome conformation. This isn't always the case, and we can talk about that more later if you're interested in. Now let's move the red dye to the other important factor here, elongation factor G. Okay. Now this should not reside on the ribosome, according to uh, the molecular models. Right? It should transiently bind and reset the ribosome. And so here we're looking at now, again, translation of a repeating phenylalanine lysine messenger RNA, where the green signal 
monitors the rotational state of the ribosome, that electrocardiogram that I talked to you about, and the red signal monitors simultaneously on that ribosome EFG occupancy. And I think you can see, every time I go from high green to low green, you get this spike of red. High green, low green, spike of red. High green, low green, spike of red. High green, low green, spike of red. Remember, high green is the rotated state. EFG comes on the ribosome, does something, very briefly, the ribosome changes conformation, and EFG departs. And you can see it's directly correlated with that at this level of visual resolution. We'll see in a moment. We'll blow it up. There are spikes of red. Ah, there are spikes, though, that are a fret that changes. This is probably photophysics. But more importantly, there are spikes of red that are not in the right place. Okay? Sometimes I get binding to the rotated state that are non-successful events. Right? Mainly, I get them to the rotated state. Every so often, I get them to the non-rotated state. We'll talk about that in a moment. Right. So now let's just take all of these events and just superimpose them. All right. First, remember, I can go in and subselect events. So I'm just going to take events that led to resetting of the ribosome. So events that were around a ribosome conformational change. So that's the conformational change right here. And I set that as time t equals zero. Because the question is, does the, is it factor binding? that drives the conformational change? Is it EFG hydrolysis of GTP that sets the conformational change? Or is it the dissociation of the factor that resets the ribosome? And this type of experiment, I think you can see, is tailor-made to answer these kind of questions. So if I superimpose the events, you can see EFG on average comes on about 100 milliseconds. This is that room temperature comes, all these kinetics are faster when we do them at 37 but about 100 milliseconds or 80 milliseconds before the conformational change. So the binding event per se is not correlated to conformational change. You get the change to happen, and then you can see it dissociates very rapidly after the conformational change. Okay, so that's interesting. We can go in and in detail study the lifetimes of these individual single molecule events. This is how I pull out bulk kinetics. Right, if I have a simple two-step process, right, that will be exponentially distributed. If I can measure the lifetimes of the individual events, I get the time constant of that exponential. I can pull out rate constants and correspond those to bulk kinetics. However, if I have multiple processes, all with the same type of rate-limiting set, so in this case, I have multiple slow steps, Right? Your exponential distribution, where you just have some fast events and one slowest step, can turn to this type of peaked Poissonian distribution. So that was interesting to us, because when we plotted the lifetimes of successful EFG binding events, they had this type of peaked distribution. So there has to be multiple rate-limiting steps going on here. Our interpretation is one of those steps is GTP hydrolysis by EFG. Now, does this make sense? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we can look at the kinetics that occur before dissociation. That's what's peaked before the conformational change. The kinetics of dissociation, it's fast, but we can get a few points, seem to be exponential. In other words, if there's multiple steps, we feel that it occurs before the conformational change. Right. So this is suggesting that GTP hydrolysis is a driving force for resetting the ribosome, i.e. translocation. So this is a big question in the field. What is GTP hydrolysis doing? Is it an active power stroke that occurs in lots of molecular motors? Or is it a passive factor that's just controlling occupancy in, at these states and related to dissociation of, 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 of uh, the factors? This is technically a little challenging to do, just because there's a lot of steps in translation that require GTP. But here's how we did this experiment. Here is a single, kind of a single turnover type event, um, where I use EFG with GTP, and you get the usual spike and the resetting of the ribosome. If I do the same experiment with GDPNP, you can see the spikes are fatter, right? and you need multiples of them in order to eventually reset the ribosome you do eventually reset the ribosome if you don't hydrolyze GTP. It just 
is that the dwell times are longer, so you have to sit on the ribosome for longer periods of time, and eventually, after about five sampling events, you can uh, thermally drive the ribosome to this uh, different conformational state. So GTP hydrolysis accelerates the process of translocation, but it's not essential. So again, we're manipulating our way over different barrier heights. You can see the efficiency is pretty good here, and this is old data. We see about 1.1 GTPs hydrolyzed per successful event. So that's that good usage of energy. Yes. Ah, so okay. So so you're asking a different question, okay? Which is, I I have a messenger RNA. Okay, that messenger RNA has the tRNA bound through three codon interactions. I'm gonna sh we're gonna talk a little bit about more of that later. Okay, um, sometimes the reading frame shifts by one nucleotide. This is frame shifting. Okay, sometimes there are signals built into the messenger RNA that tell the ribosome to do that on purpose. It's called program frame shifting. Um, the short answer is yes, tRNA modifications in the anticodon loop, and a number of groups have shown this, affect the frequency of program frame shiftings and non program frame shiftings. Okay? Yes? Yes. And, and that's known, right? That, 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 And people have observed back translocation. Now, this is a controversial field. There is a, there's a protein factor that's thought to drive back translocation. It's just the data here is still a little murky. But yes, it seems as though there is a finite probability for a back translocation event. Okay, so here's the bottom line, is that um, during normal translation, you get use of GTP, to reset the ribosome and efficient translocation. Interestingly, these events that we saw in the traces that were non-productive, their lifetimes are exponentially distributed. So we use that as a very crude kinetic signature to say those events didn't hydrolyze GTP, whereas the successful ones did. Okay, so here's the energy usage, just very crudely put over, is that what drives the initial conformational change is peptide bond formation, which releases about 8 kcals per mole, and GTP hydrolysis provides the free energy of resetting the ribosome. And you can see these are matched, and it suggests that the energy barriers here are not enormous, right, because we need this to be a rather rapid process, but they are greater than thermal. Right? And so we believe it's some barrier height, certainly greater than 1.5, and I don't know, we're just putting an upper limit of about 3 kcals per mole. Now, what happens if I again start to throw in those grains of sand, those little 100 Dalton antibiotics? So in this experiment, I throw in a drug, spectinomycin. Spectinomycin binds to the ribosome, the small subunit of the ribosome, and it blocks the ability of the ribosome to go back from the rotated state to the non-rotated state. It increases the energy barrier for that process. Now what you can see is, here I had a nice resetting of the ribosome, but you start to see, you know, the translation's irregular. This, look, it took one, two, three, four, five, six, it took eight EFG binding events to reset the ribosome. So now the process is inefficient, and if you look at the lifetimes of those binding events, sorry, if you look at the lifetimes now, these binding events, they show that peak distribution, even the unsuccessful ones. So during this process, the non-successful EFG binding events are using EFG. They're just futile cycles of GTP hydrolysis. So it just shows you how nicely tuned this energy landscape is and how easy it is to perturb it through small molecules and now we'll see through natural processes as well. So Here's just a very simple question, which is, I'm a ribosome, and I'm moving down a messenger RNA. Okay? I have to deal with RNA structure. Okay? RNAs fold back on themselves, they have secondary structure, they have tertiary structure. How does the ribosome deal with these downstream secondary structures? I won't talk about upstream structures, those are interesting as well. All right? And here's an example. All right, what I did is I just 
take a repeating messenger RNA, and I'm going to append RNA hairpins at different positions uh, on that messenger RNA. And we know from the structure of the ribosome that it requires about 12 nucleotides to go from the beginning of the P site to where the messenger RNA comes out of the ribosome and would encounter a secondary structure. Oh, I'm, time's up. Okay, so we'll stop. All right, but um, let me just show you a little bit here is that when I place a hairpin right at the position where it should be encountered, translation just barrels along fine, barrels along fine, barrels along fine, until it encounters this lysine codon. And then at this lysine codon, it hits the base of this hairpin, and I get a huge pause in high green. Remember, high green is that ro rotated pre-translocation state. So the ribosome gets into a pre-translocation state, now has to translocate into secondary structure and melt that secondary structure. Now I've increased the lifetime in this state by factors of 20 and beyond. Okay? So pauses in this rotated state lead, to bar lead from barriers of movement of the ribosome down the messenger RNA. The reason I bring this up, these type of pauses are the prelude to what the gentleman asked in the back, all of these frame shifting and recoding events. Think about it this way. I'm a ribosome and I'm translocating. Okay? That translocation step is by definition the point where the ribosome holds most weakly on to the messenger RNA and tRNA because it needs to move them from one place to another. At the transition state, it really needs to let go entirely of the P site and A site codon, anti-codon pairs. So this is a place where interaction between the ribosome, mRNA, and tRNAs are loosened up to be colloquial. Okay? And that's why these are places where we can rearrange the ribosome on the messenger RNA. So I'll stop there. I had a whole other uh, thing if we want to talk about it more. But let's just summarize the basics of translation dynamics, which is tRNA is selected on this non-rotated state. Selection involves multiple states. Right? And so you build up the fidelity by coupling it, as Hopfield pointed out now decades ago, through coupling to non-reversible events uh, uh, like GTP hydrolysis. Right? And we build up fidelity in this way to maximize the weak free energy of codon-anticodon interaction. Um, peptide bond formation changes the ribosome and also changes the tRNA configurations. The usage of energy on the ribosome is very efficient normally, but this can be changed by drugs, by secondary structures. I didn't tell you about this. By strange peptide sequences that have to snake their way through the exit tunnel. Um, and normally these processes are very rapid with little waste of energy, but it's really in the regulation of this process that I, I think we're going to see a lot of biology. So I'll stop there. We have time for a few questions, I guess. Yes, the Bashish. Yeah. yeah. I guess minus one. Yeah. Now, if it was stopping there because of the secondary structure, just by shifting by one, how does it become easier for it then to move onward? Okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about frame shifting. Um, and and i have done a, a lot of experiments using these type of approaches around frame shifting. So frame shifting involves so-called slippery sequences. I love using chalkboards. Um, in like a simple version, you would have a sequence something like this. So it's, there's seven nucleotides, a heptanucleotide sequence. Right? And you can see you have ambiguity. You could have a U, U, U. Let's do it this way. You have a U, 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 tRNA here, right? and a U, 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 tRNA here. Right? And let's call that the zero frame. Right? And then you can move in the minus one direction. So you can imagine this in two dimensions. It's easy to do, right? I pull on this bunch of A's, boop, and move it by one, and now this U goes pair with here, this to here, this to here, right? That seems, oh, that's just, you just move by one nucleotide. But now my reading frame's entirely changed. Everything subsequent to it, I read in different three 
nucleotide pairs. Okay, so that's minus one frame shifting. Right? That's in a two-dimensional uh, 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 state. Usually, this doesn't occur very frequently. Okay, um, less than one percent is the spontaneous frame shifting rate. What you then do in, in some systems is you put a secondary structure downstream at a very precise distance from the frame shifting site. Okay? It turns out to be exactly the distances I just showed you. So as I go along and I translate, okay, I get into this paused state that I just showed you. But what I showed you was not a system that could frame shift. There was no slippery sequence. If you have a slippery sequence, you do the same thing. And I didn't show you this. EFG goes through these futile cycles, of the same as I showed you with the drugs, where it tries to translocate into the secondary structure. The frame shifting event, we believe, occurs at the transition state. Okay? And you have a finite probability. The longer you stay in that, that pause state, the more probability you have of, of undergoing the frame shifting event. Because the frame shift looks easy to do here on the blackboard, but in, t in three dimensions, and I probably have this somewhere in a slide. Let me just show this to you. Question. My main question is that if it shifts frame shift by minus one, yeah. after that, how does it become easier for you to overcome this secondary structure? Yeah, it, it doesn't, okay? So we, the frame shifting, there's two events that occur. There's the reading frame change, which are, we think occurs in this transition state during the pause. Once you get out of the frame, whether you're in the zero frame or, or minus one frame, you still have to get through that secondary structure. So there's another period of time where you still have to resolve that state and get out and then elongate again. So the frame shifting itself does not help you get out of the, 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 the long delay time, okay? Just the longer that you delay, the higher your probability of frame shifting. Probably the simplest way to, to state it. I guess